and welcome to Millsaps College. I'm Rob Perrigan. It's my privilege to serve as president of Millsaps and to welcome you here tonight for this very special occasion. Tonight we gather to celebrate the life and legacy of one of Millsaps' most distinguished graduates, Paul Ramsey, class of 1935. The son of a Methodist minister, Ramsey grew up in Mendenhall, Mississippi, and came to Millsaps in 1931. After graduating from the college, he went on to Yale University, where he received a divinity degree and a PhD in religion. He spent almost his entire professional life at Princeton, where he was a professor of Christian ethics for over 40 years. One of the greatest ethicists of the 20th century, Ramsey inspired generations of thinkers. Stanley Hauerwas, Kathleen Cavaney, Jeffrey Stout are among the many ethicists and theologians who have been influenced by Ramsey and they've graciously agreed to help us commemorate tonight the 100th anniversary of his birth. It's no exaggeration to say that our panelists are three of the truly great thinkers of our day. And we're privileged that they would share some time and some of their memories of a man who influenced them personally and professionally, as well as reflect on Ramsey's intellectual legacy for the present and future. Stanley Hauerwas, professor of theological ethics at Duke Divinity School with a joint appointment at Duke's Law School, was named America's Best Theologian in 2001 by Time Magazine. Hauerwas is a lifelong member of the United Methodist Church and traces his roots back to our home state of Mississippi. A trenchant critic of those who assume the easy compatibility of Christian discipleship and democratic citizenship, Hauerwas has consistently called the church to resist the status quo and to be a countercultural voice for peace in a world beset by violence. Christians can only live faithfully, he insists, if they worry less about efficacy and focus instead on their, what their faith requires. Jeffrey Stout visits us from Princeton University, where he is a member of the Department of Religion and is associated with several other departments and centers on campus. Former president of the American Academy of Religion, Stout has published numerous articles and books in ethics, religion, and political theory. He's displayed throughout his life and career an abiding commitment to defending the ethical dimensions of democratic citizenship. He's argued persuasively that religious folks need not make the difficult choice between their faith commitments and active participation in democratic self-government. I might also add that it was in a conversation I had this last summer with one of Professor Stout's current PhD students, Michael Lamb, and my special assistant and colleague, Kenneth Townsend, that the idea for tonight's uh, panel discussion was sparked. So I want to thank Michael in his absence uh, for encouraging this idea, and Kenneth, who's here tonight moderating the panel for promoting and organizing this, this event. So thank you, Kenneth. A professor of law and theology at Notre Dame and currently a visiting professor at Yale, what Yale's Divinity School, Kathleen Cavaney has focused her career on exploring the moral foundations and implications of law. A scholar who finds connections between things not obviously connected, Professor Cavaney has, <laughs> among other things, helped show how the divergent ideas of Professors Hauerwas and Stout can be applied to and manifested in America's legal and political contexts. Before entering the academy, uh, Cavaney clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals judge, uh, John T. Noonan, Jr., who is himself a scholar of law and religion, and she later worked as an associate at the international law firm of Ropes and Gray in its health, uh, health law group. I don't know exactly where our panelists will take the discussion this evening, but I know it will not be difficult for them to connect Ramsey's ethics to important issues of the day. I'm reminding of a piece, I'm reminded of a piece uh, written just last year by Professor Cavaney titled, Why President Obama Should Read Paul Ramsey. <laughs> Very interesting article. If you republish it, just say, Why President Obama Should Read Paul Ramsey, a graduate of Millsaps College. <laughs> I promise. Good, good. <laughs> Our panelists have, in different ways, carried the torch once held by Ramsey. His legacy and their ongoing work call for us to take seriously many of the big questions of the day. Like Ramsey, the questions that our panelists have spent their lives addressing are not easily cabined in a single discipline, and they implicate theoretical as well as practical matters. As I read over some of the panel's writings before tonight's event, I found myself asking questions like, 
What, if any, intrinsic value is there to democratic citizenship? Is an ends justifies the means reasoning inevitable in politics? How ought the church react and interact with the world? How ought Christians in particular or religious people in general balance the obligations of citizenship and the demands of their faith? Indeed, can a Christian be a good citizen? These questions of principle in turn bear directly on concrete discussions and decisions of politicians, theologians, citizens, and believers, decisions which of course affect our daily lives in ways big and small. As many of you know, we're in strategic planning implementation mode here at Millsaps. One of the six overarching goals of the strategic plan is to reaffirm our ethical heritage and our relationship with the United Methodist Church. We've made important strides in these areas. Among other things, we've held programs highlighting Millsap's role in the civil rights movement, and we've developed a curricular focus on matters of social justice. Tonight's event reflects our ethical heritage in a new way, in a different way. In addition to the pastors and activists who are part of our cloud of witnesses guiding the way for us, there are great thinkers, perhaps none uh, greater than Paul Ramsey, who called us to consider the moral implications of our commitments. Ramsey's, Ramsey remains influential today, in part because he embodied so completely many of the best elements of a Millsaps education. He deftly navigated a range of disciplines while showing us how our commitments made by our minds and our hearts ought to shape the way we live. So thank you all for joining us tonight as Millsaps once again demonstrates its, itself to be a public square where important issues of the day are discussed and where the relationship between reason, faith, and action is explored and reinforced. So please join me now in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you President Perigen for those remarks. And um, I'd also like to welcome our panelists. Uh, thank you so much for being here for this special occasion. And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I think we're really in for a treat. My job is to get out of the way for the most part. I'm gonna moderate very lightly. Um, but may we begin by giving Kenneth a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. This is a fun part of my job for sure. Not to say there are any non-fun parts, but, <laughs> but this is especially fun part of my job. Um, let me just give you a quick overview of what we're going to be doing. We're going to begin by having some brief personal reflections from our panelists. Each of our panelists knew Paul Ramsey quite well personally, so they're going to share some of their reflections. After each has a quick turn of that, then we're going to go back through and have some more idea-based conversation discussing his intellectual legacy and how it might be relevant for us today. I don't know exactly where they're going to take it either, so we'll see. <laughs> um, after that, there'll be a little conversation between them um, or among them, and then we're going to have some time for some questions um, for our audience at the end. Um, so if you don't mind at this point, please put your cell phones on silent um, if you haven't already done so. And with that, I think it's time to go ahead and start things off. And I believe Professor Howas is our uh, first uh, speaker. I get to go first because of my Mississippi roots. My, uh, my mom was hard scrabble um, right outside Kosciuszko. Uh, I, um, I will never forget when we went to uh, the Baptist church in which she was raised. And uh, of course you always ask, I was maybe 12, and uh, you're always asked the visitor to read the Bible. Uh, and so I went up and I felt the Bible, and underneath was a gift from the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, so uh, I, <laughs> I, uh, I have some sense of Mississippi, and I think that's one of the reasons uh, Paul, uh, Paul had deep uh, Mississippi roots. He was very fond of his father. Um, his, he called him a fundamentalist, and, uh, and of course, he, as a Methodist, he got um, moved around Mississippi, but um, uh, he, his father um, wrote Paul letters of recommendation when he was in graduate school, and Paul met meticulously saved those uh, and, uh, and showed them and read them to me at one time. Um, he was uh, a larger-than-life uh, person, um, uh, oftentimes identified as a conservative, 
But I wanted to read you a self-description of a letter he wrote to Sid McCauley um, uh, about developments in his own life. He says, I was among the thousands of ministers and young people who, as World War II approached, were pacifist. Also at Millsaps, we were socialist, interracialist, and opponents of intercollegiate football. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Um, he said, as a brutal sport. He said, I remember when back teaching at Millsaps in 1937 and 39, after two years at Yale Divinity, making a speech at a rally from the steps of one of the buildings and reading a telegram I'd sent to President Roosevelt to stay out of the war. The occasion, I believe, was Hitler's move into Poland, but it might have been some other event. I mean, this is a very different Paul Ramsey than many people um, uh, had the impression of him at the time. Then he talks about how uh, the work of Reinhold Niebuhr really then began to change his pacifist views. Um, Paul was a person of extraordinary friendship. I will never forget one of the first times we were talking was at a Society of Christian Ethics meeting in Atlanta. And we were having breakfast, and I was just a brash young kid. And he looked at me, and he said, how it was? I like you. You're interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, what a, what a, uh, what a wonderful um, uh, affirmation. And we, we stayed uh, close friends uh, throughout his life. Uh, he wa I think partly uh, we stayed close friends because he was such uh, uh, a personally and intellectually gregarious person. He was always ready, oh, I need to read, and he would read it. Um, and he would have very interesting th things to say about what he read. And as we will talk, he, Paul also had very deep theological judgments that uh, were not, I always kidded him, I'd say, Paul, uh, after basic Christian ethics, all your theology is in the prefaces of your books. Uh, um, uh, he says, yes, and that's, um, that's where it should be. Uh, the, uh, uh, but he, was, uh, he, he had very strong uh, theological uh, convictions. Uh, but I think what is overwhelming about Paul was what a deep human being he was. And... Um, uh, you need, it, it's, it's, it's has to be very carefully put, but he was in a difficult marriage. Uh, Effie, he had come back, by the way, he, before he finished his PhD, he came back to Millsaps to marry Effie. Uh, she was a musician. And um, Effie had some very serious medical problems. And Paul stayed remarkably faithful through those years uh, in a way that was very important for me because I also was married 25 years to a lady who was bipolar. And Paul was always ready to be in conversation about that. He was also, he, he, he met my son, Adam, and uh, Adam was going through a rather hard time, uh, things were not good at home, at Haverford College. And Adam, on his own, thought, I'll call Paul Ramsey <laughs> and, um, uh, and see if Paul can help me. And Paul invited him for the weekend and took him apple picking. <laughs> now that, uh, that, I mean, that was the kind of thing that Paul Ramsey would do. I think he had a kind of, uh, um, I think he liked lost puppies. And that's what I think I was. And uh, that's <laughs> someone like Bill Werpahowski, who's also, uh, we're kind of lost puppies. And he would reach out to you to, um, uh, uh, to give you uh, friendship, uh, which didn't um, um, mean that he didn't have a terrific sense of humor and <laughs> also would also he, he, he didn't take being made fun of all that great <laughs> I once um, I, I once um, uh, introduced him 
at a speech he was to give at Notre Dame when I was teaching there. And, and I said, and I, and I, we always kidded Paul about his writing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I thought, well, I'll start. And I said, Paul, of course, is a master stylist. And I would like to read you a sentence from War um, uh, and the Christian Conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, the, and so I read this sentence. If at this point the natural man in us exclaims, or the man insufficiently schooled by Christ, that it is humanly impossible to let go the blow and withhold the animosity, or to let go the bullet and withhold the intention in the manner Aquinas describes, and moreover that it is bad casuistry to suppose there is much difference anyway between an act which is good and right in its species according to what is intended, and one that is not, since both bring about the death of the attacker with equal certainty. If any Christian should say this, and should he also propose as an alternative that the matter be settled more simply on grounds of the plain right of self-defense, then it might be replied that this means to let go justice at an attacker and withhold love. And this shows the complex intentionality of any Christian action in such critical situations. Except, of course, <laughs> Uh, except, of course, an act of non-resistance to either innocent or unjust aggressor alike. <laughs> I said, I, I then said, um, uh, this either indicates that Paul Ramsey is really a German that writes his sentences out in German and then translates them into <laughs> English, or that he is, um, or, or that because he's at Princeton, he must be part of the school of Joyce Carol Oates, the name of the school of automatic writing. He, um, uh, he, he didn't say much at that time. The next his, week, his I got... His prose loses something in the original. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the next week, I got a card from him that, you, you know, it said, Paul Ramsey, B.S., B.D., Ph.D., D.Lit., um, D.Science, H.L.D., 713, 79 Hall, Princeton Common, New Jersey. Did you ever get one of these, Jeff? I'm sure I did. And then on the back of the card, it said, uh, um, um, it quotes a review of War and the Christian Conscience that says, incidentally, the book is written in a beautifully articulate style which reveals <laughs> an exceptionally clear and charitable mind and makes it, insofar as any book on this subject can be, a positive pleasure to read. <laughs> Which meant then I carried this card in my billfold. You can see it's all a billfold for many years to always take out uh, when it came time. Uh, uh, Paul never, I think, held um, grudges. And uh, he certainly didn't, he never held a grudge. I mean, I, I am a pacifist, and so we had plenty to talk about. But I was, we were working on a book called Speak Up for Just War and Pacifism, and I he was at the Center for Theological Inquiry after he retired. And I walked into his office and I said, what in the hell are those boxes? He said, they're my papers. I said, your papers? I said, I just assumed you were giving them to Princeton Seminary. He said, they didn't want them. And he said, neither does Princeton University. I said, we'll take them. And we did. So if you want to read Paul's wonderfully lively letters, come to Duke and read Paul Rand. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Professor Hawass. And I might say that the long sentence actually displays something of his Mississippi and maybe Faulknerian influence. That's right. That's right. It's all Faulkner, uh, uh, right? Yeah. There. Faulkner, I'd say. All right. Now I think it's Professor Caveney's. Uh, I think or, it's it's Professor okay. Stone. Sorry. Great. Well, I, I want to tell the story of my relationship with Paul Ramsey. And it's really a story about not holding grudges. And it's a story about transformation. The first time Paul Ramsey changed my life was before I met him. <laughs> and I had only read him. So here's what happened. In 1968, a few months after the King and Robert Kennedy assassinations, I left Trenton, New Jersey, my hometown, and went to Brown University to start college, 1968. At that time, the major influences on my life and thinking were Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi. It's a pleasure to see 
the statues on your campus. And uh, when I got to Brown, I founded a nonviolence resistance workshop. I was a pacifist. And um, I submitted my application for status as a conscientious objector. Of course, the Vietnam War was in full swing. Then a year later, I, with all those commitments in play, uh, I was in Don Kallenbach's graduate seminar on Christian ethics. You'll remember Don Kallenbach. Oh, absolutely. He's a close friend. One of your Yale classmates, I guess. Anyway, in that seminar, I read Paul Ramsey, and my, uh, my pacifism was destroyed. That is to say, um, he talked me out of my position. This was a costly conversion <laughs> because I... Uh, I realized that the principles that my nonviolence resistance workshop were built on were gone. And I also realized that in, if I were going to be honest, which I was committed to being, I had to withdraw my uh, conscientious objector application. I still thought I didn't agree with him on the ethics of the Vietnam War. I still I thought the Vietnam War, the US involvement in it, was unjust. But you couldn't, in those days, be a conscientious objector without believing that all war was wrong. So here I was, I, you know, thanks to Paul Ramsey, I was contemplating heading to Canada. And I was running <laughs> um, the Rhode Island Draft Information Center. I was the director of it. And I was running it out of a room across the hall from the chaplain's office in Fonts Hall and at Brown. That turns out to be the room where I met Paul Ramsey. He was invited to come to the Brown campus to speak, and he spoke there in that room, not realizing that it was that room doubled as the Rhode Island Draft Information Center, but he uh, spoke in that room on, uh, in support of um, US involvement in the Vietnam War, and um, that was my first meeting. Now let's fast forward just a couple of years. It's 1972. Um, the previous year, I had applied for, for um, to graduate schools. And one of the schools I applied to was Princeton. I talked to my senior thesis advisor, Jock Reeder. And he said, so you're applying to Princeton? I said, yes. And he knew I had been influenced by Ramsey. He, Jock Reeder, had been Ramsey's, one of Ramsey's junior colleagues at Princeton. And um, he was squeezed out by Ramsey in the tenure decision in favor of Gene Outka. Oh, I okay. never knew that. And Jock said to me, Jock, Jock said, I think you better, you better not <laughs> apply to work with Ramsey. You're not his type. <laughs> That's what Jock told me. So I didn't apply to work with Ramsey. I applied in the adjacent field, the philosophy of religion, and I was admitted, and that's where I went. So during my graduate career, I didn't take any courses with Paul Ramsey. I took courses in the philosophy of religion and courses in ethics with Gene Outka. Then what happened is that Gene Outka left for Yale, that left a vacancy. And Gil Mylander, who was Paul Ramsey's favorite and very close to him theologically and politically, applied for the job, and so did I. He and I were selected as finalists for the job. And I, I'll never forget my um, my interview with Paul Ramsey in his office. He expressed puzzlement as to why someone who didn't share his Christian commitments was interested in the subject. And he also told me that he was going to favor someone else 
but if that didn't work out, it would be okay with him if I were appointed. <laughs> I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> then something very strange happened. I got a call from the chair of the department saying that I had been selected for the job. This was very surprising to me. It's puzzling. How did it happen? I asked, um, I expressed my puzzlement to Victor Preller, who was one of my advisors and now suddenly one of my colleagues. How did this happen? He said it was a misunderstanding. Ramsey had gone, this was breaking confidentiality. He shouldn't have been telling me this, but he did. He said Ramsey came into the meeting of the faculty and somebody said, okay, Paul, you're the senior figure in the field. Just state your preference and we'll defer to it. And Ramsey said, no, 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 no. That's not how it's supposed to work. Now, when he said that, he didn't mean ignore my opinion. <laughs> but a bunch of the colleagues took him to be releasing him from the ordinary de deference given to the senior figure in a field. So it's because of that misunderstanding, Vic Preller told me, that I got the job off. <laughs> okay. I joined the department, I, uh, and I served as his teaching assistant and taught some other courses, and I was in the process of finishing my dissertation. During that period, the early months, uh, I got the cold shoulder. That uh, It took him a few months to figure out that he wasn't angry with me, he was angry with my colleagues. So that's the first grudge not held, right? Then it comes to pass that Gil Mylander, the other, his favorite, the candidate, the other candidate for the job, this is almost a biblical story, isn't it? It is. Yeah. He, uh, he and I are to be examined, our dissertation defenses are scheduled for the same day, Gill's in the morning, mine in the afternoon. And that's to make possible Gene Outka's one day trip down to Princeton mm -hmm. to examine both of us. So here's what happens. First Gill's defense is held and he's awarded distinction. Now the afternoon comes. It's not an easy moment for me. I go in there, I'm thinking, I'm not sure I deserve distinction, but if I don't get it, they're gonna be saying they made a mistake. <laughs> so I give my presentation, the question, round after round of questions, and Ramsey is turning red. And he's over there and he's, <laughs> And I'm wondering what's going to happen because he's obviously pissed off at the other questioners and maybe me for all I know. So what, what does he say? He says, <clears throat> well, Mr. Stout, <clears throat> <laughs> unlike your other advisors and readers, I'm going to ask you some difficult questions. <laughs> implying that they had not done their jobs. They were giving me slow pitches. And he said, Mr. Stout, your dissertation defends a correspondence theory of truth, or rather a coherence theory of truth. There are standard objections to a coherence theory of truth. Will you please state all of them and give your responses to them? <laughs> I said, I was, I, you know, sensing the takedown, I said, Professor Ramsey, my dissertation does not defend a coherence theory of truth defends a coherence theory of justification 
therefore your question is irrelevant to what I have written. Ooh. And you're still here. I'm still here. <laughs> what I had sensed was that he hadn't read the dissertation. That is, it wasn't his job. He wasn't one of the readers. He was just sensing that the readers hadn't done their job, so he's trying to step in and ask the right question. But it's very hard, it would be impossible to, very difficult to read all of what he had to read for the one day. The next semester, anyway, I was given distinction. I'm not sure I deserved it, but you can imagine how my colleagues, it was a long deliberation. Nobody told me what happened in it. So the next semester, the departmental chair, John Wilson, assigned Ramsey to be my teaching assistant. That was a stroke of administrative genius. Anyway, that moment where we were examined on the same day, Gil and I, that brought back the cold shoulder for another few months. And then again, he figured out that he wasn't angry with me. He was angry with somebody else. That period in which we served as each other's teaching assistant began a relationship that I would characterize initially as professional collegiality, but it blossomed month by month into a, you can hear my voice starting to crack, into, uh, it blossomed into a very deep personal friendship. Every weekday, Paul Ramsey and Victor Preller and whatever students, including Kathy Caveney and the aforementioned Bill Werpahowski, would wander into the departmental lounge in 1879 Hall. For something like two or three hours, we would talk every day about the most important things that had happened reported in the New York Times, or the latest book that had been published in Christian Ethics, or a significant work of philosophy, all just on the fly. It was an amazing education. Yeah. It was uh. worth a hundred times my three years in graduate school. Mm. Okay, so this is from, so I, I arrived as a graduate student in 1972. I joined the faculty in 1975. From 1975, basically, through to his death in 1988, um, I got to be part of this amazing, wondrous conversation among brilliant people who put their biases aside and with utterly open minds and deep hearts, let the sparks fly to the heavens. One last episode. One day after he retired, Paul came to me and told me that he had cancer. He, he knocked on my door, said, well, I have something important to talk about. Can I come in? I said, sure. A few months later was his last meeting of the Society of Christian Ethics. It was down at Durham. Duke. Duke. He gave a splendid valedictory address. His doctor put everything into making it possible for this extremely ill dying man to be present to his profession one last time and he gave an amazing valedictory address. After which, many of us were invited back to the spacious rooms that had been rented for him or set aside for him on this occasion. And I'll never forget this. He and Charlie Reynolds pulled me aside and told me that they had selected me to succeed Paul 
as the president of the Board of Trustees of the Journal of Religious Ethics. He had been the only president of that journal of uh, trustees before that time. And what I realized at that moment was that this was Paul's way of saying, you're okay. All grace, all Paul Ramsey, all transformation. I just, um, um, Paul once told me, Vic Preller was one of his close friends. And Vic was a, a very unique person, <laughs> uh, to say. Uh, yeah. And he said, I told Vic, Vic, since I've known you, you've been a member of five different churches, churches being used in a loose sense, and every one of them has always been the true church. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, I mean, he, he had that sense of humor that would allow that, to invite that kind of, of wonderfully constructive uh, response that Jeff so wonderfully described. And I just have to to say that meeting in Durham, John Howard Yoder was the president of the Society of Christian Ethics. And Paul came to the, at that time, we had a big dinner, and when you would give the presidential speech, John's speech was to serve God and to rule the world. The revelation passage that is not usually given by pacifists. <clears throat> And Paul, Paul and my wife Paula and I were sitting together, and Paul sat listening to Yoder in rapt attention, and then said, that man's been hiding his light under a bushel. Hmm. That, I mean, the great pacifist theologian of our time. So that was the kind of, I mean, and he was dying. I mean, it's just, he, he was dying at that point. It was, what a privilege to be present to him at that moment. Well, thanks to you both for these reflections. It makes me really wish that I had, had known the man and was present at that very special occasion. I think now we're going to get to hear some comments from Professor Caveney as well. Yes, and first I'd like to thank you all for coming out uh, to hear us tonight. Um, it, it's a delight for me to, to be, it's my first time in the great state of Mississippi, and it's also my first time at Millsaps, and Paul would talk about Mississippi and tell me that I had to go to Mississippi because it was wonderful and the people were so kind. So I'm delighted uh, to be here um, as, as part of this event and honoring him. My two colleagues here have a different experience uh, of Paul because they got to know him in a way almost deliberately after their big professional decisions in some sense were formed. Not you at Brown, but, uh, but later. Um, I stumbled into him um, in college uh, and, and in the course of stumbling into him, stumbled into my own life's vocation uh, with, with many other pieces. So I, I just want to share a little bit of that. My mom, I told her, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going down to Mississippi. Well, why? Well, you know, to celebrate Paul Ramsey. She said, well, he shaped your entire life. And, and then there's a way in which that is true. So I grew up in Cumberland, Rhode Island, and I uh, wanted to go to college and get out of Rhode Island <laughs> uh, he was going to Rhode Island to college. I was leaving Rhode Island, so the equilibrium was sort of the same, maybe. And I picked Princeton for very superficial reasons. Um, it looked like college should look to me. Uh, it really did. It was a beautiful campus. It had a magnificent chapel. It had an adorable town. And you, you know, come to Duke. <laughs> <laughs> I could have. I could have. I didn't know. But uh, you, I mean, and you could put a snow globe over the whole thing and sell it on eBay. It was just so perfect. I mean, it was um, wonderful. Um, but there was also something less superficial about it, which was its stated focus on undergraduate education. Unlike uh, some of the other Ivy Leagues, uh, Princeton really said, we care about the undergraduates who take undergraduate teaching seriously. And so that was my stated reason for going, but behind it was this sense that 
you know, I, although I didn't know the term, you know, Princeton looked like the platonic ideal of college to me, and I was determined to kind of live that ideal. And I got to know Paul Ramsey as part of kind of living that platonic ideal of college. Um, in the fall of my freshman year, one of my friends was taking a course on Christian ethics from this legendary, eccentric professor there named Paul Ramsey. And, you know, she said, well, you know, you really ought to take it. He's part of the Princeton experience. And then so I decided the spring to take his basic Christian ethics course, which in which he went through kind of the big figures in Christian ethics, you know, uh, from, you know, well, the Bible to Augustine all the way up through uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, what that meant was she was taking his hardest course first. Which was, which will be very important in a minute in the story. Um, <laughs> extremely important. Now, Paul Ramsey was, as, as Stanley said, a big man in every sense of the term. He was physically present. Um, his character, his personality was big. His voice was big. He wore these kind of suits and sometimes three-piece suits. And, you know, you could smell pipe smoke around him. It'd be like the Wizard of Oz in, in, um, in a seminar setting uh, or his, his office hours. And his voice permeated the wood-paneled classrooms, even passing through the stone walls of the building building into Makash Courtyard. And it was the general consensus of the class that when he lectured on St. Augustine on love and justice, the great saint himself uh, would turn away from the beatific vision for a moment in order to take a few notes on his own thoughts. <laughs> so I was fascinated by the whole thing and, and somehow knew in the way you can only know when you're 18 or 19 years old that this was somehow my vocation. But there were some bumps I needed to pass through ahead. And one of the bumps involved not knowing when Professor Ramsey was being serious and when he was joking. And he had said from the beginning of class in this basic Christian ethics class that the exam would be an option. You could either uh, you know, write down the 12 uh, tribes of Israel that would be option one. Or you could write your own question and answer it, and you could be judged <laughs> on both the question and the answer. You know, And he'd said that three or four times. I thought, he's just teasing. This is a joke. He's joking about everything. No, I, I'd, I'd been to high school. I'd taken advanced placement courses. No teacher says you're going to write your own question and be judged by the um, question and the answer. But um, he wasn't actually joking. <laughs> And so the exam question I wrote, you might say, was somehow less than optimal. Yeah. <laughs> what I wrote, and I confess this here, um, I, I'm ashamed, but you know, we have to confess our sins and move on. Um, I wrote, because I thought, well, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to try to be cute. Big mistake. I wrote, why is the thought of Reinhold Niebuhr like a Thomas Sweet Blendon? having bits and pieces of its own, uh, of the tr people who have gone before, but still having its own unique flavor. Now, a Thomas, Thomas Sweet was an ice cream store on Nassau Street in Princeton, and it, what it did <laughs> was take ice cream, and you could mix in, like, Heath Bar or Snickers bars or something of that sort, and it would all be blended in, and it would have, it was delicious. You'd have, the, you know, a unique flavor of the blend in, but still could taste the component parts. This did not go over very well. <laughs> you might say that I got a grade tending toward the middle of the alphabet more than the beginning of the alphabet, <laughs> and um, though I did, I did passably well in the course itself because I had you know, spoken up so much well in precept. But I didn't give up. I was discouraged, but I didn't give up. So I took his, in the fall of my sophomore year, I took his course on Christian ethics and modern moral problems, you know, abortion, euthanasia, um, uh, just war. And there were two assessment issues here, uh, or qu uh, possibilities here. One was you could take a normal three hour exam, you know, um, he'd give the questions this time, he assured me. Um, and then the second was you could write a big term paper. And I said, I'm gonna write the term paper. And he said, you know, Kathy, there are some people who should write term papers for classes, and there are some people who should study very, very hard for their exams. <laughs> And, and I said, yeah, I'm writing the paper. Um, <laughs> uh, and 
he, once it was clear I wasn't dissuaded, uh, he helped me. I, I would get a note. I, I was doing it on abortion and the law. I'd get two or three times a week a little clipping, a little note, a little, well, you should read this, but be careful of this point. Uh, you know, uh, take a look at this. There's someone so who's written this article, and I don't think it's very good, but you really need to deal with it if you're going to address the issue of abortion and the law. And these just kept coming. And in fact, I was sort of broken up. I'm, I'm moving from South Bend to, to Boston soon, and was going through some old papers and I found some of those notes in the, in the very multicolored, he used either purple or green, very fine felt pens. You know, you could still see the faded color in his notes. He used green instead of red because green means go. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, green means go. <laughs> okay. And it wasn't like I was something special, mind you. I mean, he wasn't doing it because I was special. I'd already pretty much shown I wasn't special in the exam I'd written. I was just a student who wanted to write a paper. He was doing that because that's who he was as a professor as a teacher, as a conversation partner. And um, he was no respecter of persons in that sense. You know, the lowliest undergrad and the, and the highest chaired professor deserved his attention um, in, uh, and, and, and got it. Uh, so, and I, it was only when I became a teacher myself, a professor myself, I realized how rare that, uh, that kind of gift of attention was to, um, to him, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and something so unusual and something I'm so grateful for. Um, as Jeff's also pointed out, uh, understanding Paul Ramsey as a teacher and a scholar of ethics means situating him in the context of a community, and that community is the lounge at in the religion department at 1879 Hall. Um, Paul was not only there, you could almost say he held court there and, and seminar there, and the sacred text and the seminar reading was really the New York Times for the most part. Every day he'd come in and he'd read something and we'd have to sit and talk about it. But it was a good place, that lounge, to learn imminent criticism, something I've learned from my other teacher, Jeff Stout, because Jeff was also a professor of mine as well. How to critique the presuppositions of an argument, how to look at the logic of an argument, how to pull it apart and consider unintended ramifications of it for public policy, how to consider whether a proposal would fit with human nature. And one place where Paul had tremendous theological commitments was in his sense of the sinfulness of human nature, the sense that human nature was not all going to be just, you know, Thomas Sweet ice cream blended into <laughs> some sort of human perfection. Um, Paul Ramsey was a great polemicist. He could see through an argument, uh, I've heard people say, better, just see through it with laser-type precision. And, and he saw through the argument, and maybe he saw through the pre people making them, but he never uh, let a good argument get in the way of per interpersonal uh, kindness. Um, he did not view his intellectual adversaries as personal enemies. And he was never afraid to change his mind. I remember the first time I said something to him, um, you know, and he said, well, you know, maybe I'll have to rethink that. You know, the I had actually caused the great Paul Ramsey to rethink something. And he said that all the time because for him, thinking and writing uh, was not about being right once and for all. It was about pursuing truth, you know, which we're never going to get to because only God has the truth. You know, I mean, in, in the best way that we can with all our humility, with all our fallibility, and with all our conversation partners around us. So it's that vision of what the academic life and the Christian intellectual life um, that he had, that he, along with these gentlemen here, frankly, uh, imparted to me, and and for which I will be tremendously grateful, because I can't separate his influence upon me from my vocational choices or my fundamental values. Well, thank you so much. Let's give him. Let's pause here and give him a quick hand. So. As we've heard from our panelists, it sounds like Professor Ramsey was one whose um, personal and professional uh, 
commitments and interests and ways of relating intersected in significant ways. So in some respects, what we've done here might sound a little bit artificial in trying to bracket the, the personal reflections from some of the more academic reflections, but that's what we've tried to do. So now we're gonna just transition a bit towards more of the ideas talk. What is the intellectual legacy of Professor Ramsey? And I think for this, um, Professor Stout is gonna start us off. Is that right? Yep. Okay, so now we'll hand it over to you. You've already heard a number of mentions of Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold Niebuhr, during the period in which Paul Ramsey was coming of age intellectually, politically, ethically, religiously in the 1930s and 40s, was the most influential American theologian. And he had an enormous impact on Paul Ramsey, and you've heard how. He talked him out of his own early liberal pacifism. So Paul Ramsey had an experience with reading Niebuhr like the one that I had uh, in 1969, 70, reading Paul Ramsey. That influence had to do with one thing that Kathy just mentioned, which was um, the notion that human life and above all human collectivities are shot through with sin and that realism on that point ought to chasten any kind of utopian thinking and any kind of facile faith in the reform of human arrangements. So one thing he took over from Niebuhr was the idea that we need to be realistic about that, and secondly, that we need to be sensitive to the ironies of human history. What's that about? Well, it's ironic, from Niebuhr's point of view, that liberal pacifist reformers unintentionally give comfort to tyrants who are quite happy to have liberal pacifists as their opponent. It's ironic that <coughs> communists announcing a utopian vision of a classless society several years after a revolution <coughs> are actually have their boots on the necks of the workers who were supposed to have nothing to lose but their chains and discovered that instead they were in a gulag apartheid. So it's these, all of these thoughts influence Ramsey deeply but there was one important thing about Niebuhr that stuck in his craw. Niebuhr in 1940, writing about Nazism, wrote, we ought to do whatever has to be done to prevent the triumph of this intolerable tyranny. Whatever has to be done. It was a momentous statement coming from the most influential Christian theologian in America. Paul Ramsey agreed with Niebuhr's realism. He agreed that human life was shot through with sin. He agreed with a lot of things. He agreed that tyranny had to be fought. But he rejected the idea that tyranny should be defeated by just any means. Some means, according to Ramsey, are simply impermissible. And Ramsey set out to say what they were. In other words, central to his thinking was the thought that Niebuhr needed to be corrected on the question of mean. 
to boil it down to the most important, obvious example. Ramsey held that it is simply impermissible to murder people, okay? And that murderous means in a just war are absolutely ruled out, okay? Ramsey's central, so the, the, this is very, what he was doing at this point was, to, was saying, Christian ethics is not all about purport what he called what Niebuhr called proportionality. So as, as Ramsey put it rather too gently, quote, all that Reinhold Niebuhr ever said about politics and war falls under the heading of proportionality. So what's proportionality? It's a matter of promoting the balance of good over evil and the consequences of your acts. If you act proportionately, you're, you're promoting the good and the consequences of your act. But if that's the only consideration, Ramsey said, you're losing track of St. Paul's prohibition of doing evil that good may come of it. So it became Ramsey's central intellectual project to figure out how to put that Pauline prohibition of doing evil that good may come of it together with Niebuhr's realism about sinfulness running through all human collectivities. So that, in a nutshell, is my way of characterizing Ramsey's um, sort of the one big idea of, that unifies Ramsey's career from 1960 to 1988. So what he's doing, in effect, is trying to restore to Christian ethics, and this is what, the, what this meant was an enormous alliance with Catholics across what had been a major line of difference. What he was saying was many Catholic moralists have this part right. They have a sense that there are some things that must never be done. The pacifists also are right in thinking that some things must never be done. But according to Ramsey, the pacifist misdescribe the absolute principles. Okay. They rule out all violence or all coercion. And doing that ends up giving too much aid to tyrants. The challenge of Christian ethics from Ramsey's point of view was how to articulate a responsible absolutism. Absolutes here don't mean anything about not changing your mind about something. It's a question of whether human society needs principles that rule some things out in a way that permits leaders and others to be held accountable for committing intrinsic injustices. That's all I'll say at the beginning. Wow. Um, I'm going to pick up in a way where Jeff just left off because part of what I want to highlight uh, in, in my observations on his work is, is his, his capacity to draw on ecumenical thought, particularly Catholic thought, to address some of the problems that Jeff talked about, and also his interdisciplinarity in the way he went about doing his work. Um, it, uh, you know, in 1974, Paul famously said, I always write as the ethicist I am, namely a Christian ethicist, and not as some hypothetical common denominator. And indeed he did, but it's important to pay attention to the way he did it. 
Although he received seminary training and um, was at one point an ordained Methodist minister, I think he always was if he wasn't active maybe as it, he spent his entire career teaching in an increasingly pluralistic university setting and an increasingly pluralistic department of religion. Um, and the transition, of course, from of university religion departments from sort of seminaries manque to full-blown academic departments was, was a difficult one, and we can talk about that later. And Ramsey had his own issues with it. But I would like to suggest that some of his most important work actually was facilitated by the fact that he was in a university religion department and not necessarily in a denominational seminary. Um, well, his roots remained in the American Protestant realist tradition, but the branches expanded in unexpected and intricate ways. Or you could use a metaphor in a way that's more Pauline. It is as he grafted on new ways of thinking and framing questions to his his original uh, formation and formulations of things, he, he did so in ways that made for a stronger and healthier fruit. So you've got Paul and the grafting on to the, to the grapes. Um, uh, and, and he himself actually grew grapes in his backyard. And we all got, you know, used to get you know, three or four bottles of jelly every fall that he'd made out of his own grapes. So I think it's a good metaphor. In the era in which Protestant ethicists and Catholic moral theologians lived and taught and thought in institutions and practices very isolated from one another. Catholics didn't really read Protestants. Protestants didn't really read Catholics. Each had its own sort of tradition of doing moral thought. Paul was very important in breaking down those barriers. Now, the Second Vatican Council, which took place 1962 into 1965, was sort of the opening of the Catholic Church to the modern world. But even before then, you can see it in his work, what's called Nine Modern Moralists, where he was engaged aging different uh, important uh, thinkers, not only Protestant thinkers, but also Jewish and secular and Catholic thinkers. You can see it in his engagement, say, with Jacques Martin, who was a very famous mid-20th century Catholic uh, a moralist who was working on the natural law. Now, natural laws had been done in the Catholic tradition. If you read these manuals of moral theology, it was sort of a principle and a kind of deductive application to a particular case. A historical, very certain, no doubt that the mind could, you know, kind of come to conclusions on all of these questions to guide people in confession, which was where Catholic moral thought developed, preparing people to hear confessions. Uh, Maritain didn't go about doing that. He tended to have a more inductive view of natural law. You, you learned you know, what the principles of natural law were by considering concrete cases, by considering kind of the mess of human life, and then abstracting the principles from that. You had a sense, which he called co-naturality, of what was the case in a particular instance. Um, now, Ramsey thought that this, in a way, was good because it didn't have the certainty of, of the intellectual deductiveness. Um, and he was searching, in a way, for a common morality that would have uh, you know, a, a Protestant sensibility to it, which meant a, some skepticism and humility about what the human mind could know. And, and Mar Maritain had that. But what Maritain didn't have, and this is what I've seen more recently, was kind of a disciplined way of addressing the problems that Jeff talked about. Um, Maritain's way of addressing natural <laughs> law questions was through this co-naturality, which suspiciously looked a little bit like feeling or assent or sense Ability. And, and, and that would be problematic as well because you wouldn't be able to discipline your mind and your judgments in a way that would stop you from doing what would be in your own self-interest. And you wouldn't be able to stop this kind of cost-benefit analysis either, which he was very concerned to do. So he wanted to find a way of talking about morality that was both faithful to the Christian tradition and capable of engaging uh, in a pluralistic community and started reading um, a lot more both Protestant and Catholic moralists. 
in dealing with the issues that Jeff was talking about, he looked at not only the debate in the Protestant world, this is later than Niebuhr, between Joseph Fletcher, who advocated a situationalist morality, um, and came up with a, a, a defense of, well, no, not everything is just doing what you want to do the loving thing in the situation. Sometimes love generates principles that must be This is followed. Ramsey now. This is Ramsey in particular situations. Um, so he was, uh, you know, he was uh, responding on the one hand to Joseph Fletcher's situation ethics, but he also entered into Catholic debates that were going on very much in the same vein with uh, what were called proportionalists, who also thought that the situation needed to be considered in its fullness, um, and that you just did the loving thing or the proportionate thing in the situation. Ramsey said, no, there are some things we cannot do no matter what. Intentionally killing the innocent would be one that he would hold on to. So he's engaging in the, in the Catholic debates, he's engaging in the Protestant debates, he's using them to cross-pollinate. But at the same time, um, even while he was holding on to a view of moral principles, sometimes called moral absolutes, there are some things you cannot do no matter what, he didn't entirely align himself with the Catholic conservatives. Because while he recognized that moral rules were important, including exceptionalist moral rules, he also recognized that you had to press to see what the term meant in a particular situation, a rule against adultery, for example. What is adultery? What is marriage? To decide what adultery is, you have to look at what marriage is. He was willing to press beyond the rules to see what they meant. And this could give him a kind of independence that made not just liberal Catholics uncomfortable, but also conservative Catholics. And so I wrote, uh, you know, he's considered the father of, you know, in some ways of conservative bioethics, Catholic and evangelical Protestants uh, in, 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 in the, you know, in this era. But it's in a father in a very complicated way. Um, there's a, a center called the Center for Bioethics and Culture gives a Paul Ramsey Award every year um, to an ethicist who defends, as Paul did, you know, the dignity of the unborn and the immunity of, 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 of unborn life against direct attack in things such as abortion. But at the same time, Ramsey recognized there were hard questions, such as when does a fertilized egg actually become a human being? Because you've got possibilities of twinning, one egg can split into two, and recombination, two eggs can press into one. So the kind of nuance and uncertainty and judgment that Ramsey represented in applying his principles is something that uh, we would do well uh, to, to emulate today, especially in the conservative side, in my view, of, of, of debates about controversial moral issues. I'll just say one other thing uh, so we can get on to uh, the conversation and, and first to hear Stanley. Paul Ramsey also deeply engaged other disciplines in his work. He engaged the military thought when doing just war theory. He engaged medical thought when he was doing his medical ethics. And he engaged legal thought. And the book that most exemplifies what he was doing in, in this kind of interdisciplinarity is, in my mind, a 1978 book called Ethics at the Edges of Life, where he's looking at medical, moral, legal issues. And, and book very that was probably the least read. And I always think it's one of his best. I, I just don't think it was read. I think it was. Maybe. Um, and, and you can see in his uh, deep engagement with the law, his theological principles. One thing he did, for example, was, was say, well, we really ought not to trust, trust a substituted judgment policy when it comes to incompetent patients. We ought not to say, what would this incompetent patient do if they were competent? That's an, a nonsensical question for him. He was advocating what was called a medical indications policy that looked at what was best for them medically. He also didn't trust parents, really, to make decisions and trusted courts more in making these hard decisions for incompetent patients. 
my conversation that I'd like to have with him today, if he were still around after having practiced law and healthcare law for a minute, a little bit, and been around the legal block a little bit, is is that faith in the judiciary, in, in an organ of government, really warranted, one? And two, don't you need to have some room, and he was moving toward this at the end of his life, not just for principles, but for the virtue of prudence in the application of principles. Principles are not self-applying. And the Catholic tradition um, on ethics at the end of life doesn't just consider medical indications, but considers a whole range of human concerns about whether a treatment should be continued or not. Um, and, 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 and you, Paul, would have room to acknowledge that in your system if you took the next step, and he was right on the edge of taking it before he died, which means situating the application of principles in a broader context of an understanding of what it means to be a virtuous person and what it means to be a prudent person. Because to apply a principle or a rule rightly, you have to be a prudent person. And so that would be the conversation I would have with him today. Uh, I'll I'll try to be very brief. Um, the, I think the narratives that <coughs> Jeff and Kathy have given are, are right. One of the names that has been left out is H. Richard Niebuhr. Right. He, um, he wrote his dissertation under H. Richard, and he was deeply influenced by Richard's, uh, H. Richard Niebuhr's account of the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> and that was not necessarily prominent in the casuistry that he performed. Um, but there is a sense, I read Paul partly as a person that was always in search of a theological position that would do justice to his basic intuitions. And I'm not sure he ever found it. Uh, he, um, he read Bart dogmatics as it came out in English each time. Um, and um, in a book, Eth um, uh, Christian Ethics and the Sit-In, um, he uses Bart's uh, uh, distinction between the internal and external um, um, uh, covenant. Um, as, and you get a sense of how H. Richard's um, emphasis upon uh, uh, the sovereignty of God is still working uh, for him in that. But it's more like trying to find some means to um, make intelligible what he thinks is non-negotiable. And yet, it doesn't quite work. Uh, there's a wonderful sentence in Ethics in the Christian Sit-In that I, I don't want to... I want to make sure you, you Christian know. Christian ethics and the sit-in. Christian ethics and right. sit-in. I'm sorry. Let, let the reader be encouraged if the foregoing seems obscure enough to be theologically profound. The, um, uh, <laughs> uh, he, he, he would, um, I think there was a sense that he always had a sense that he appreciated how certain theological claims that, grew out of Christology were so important, but he never kind of wanted to come to a clear declaration about it. Uh, I mean, he also read Telica at the same time he was reading Bart, and Telica, good Lutheran theologian that he was, Bart, good Reformed theologian that he was, they don't necessarily go together well. And he was always tempted toward something like an order of creation out of the Lutheran moves that I think he also knew would get himself in trouble. The other um, um, kind of developments within Paul's thought that um, um, I want to highlight is, I, I was talking to Jeff earlier, I think he's, I think in some ways he was kind of the last Protestant social gospel. He, uh, he wanted to show that you had resources within Christian civilization, and I know that phrase is fraught 
with ambiguity, but he thought there was something like that that you could draw on. He's, I wanted to read you a quote. This is from an article called Tradition and Reflection that was in the Perkins Journal in 1982. In a sense, I continue to try to do public ethics. In this endeavor, I've recently been put on notice that I may be wrong by a distinguished philosopher, Alastair McIntyre, who wrote, but any biblical position, whether Jewish or Christian, is going to be at odds, so it seems, with the dominant secular standpoints of our culture. Alliances between theologians and secular thinkers are going to be limited to specific points or easily fractured by disagreements elsewhere. The modern secular world may provide fewer allies than Ramsey believes. Then Paul says, at the same time, I continue to try to do church ethics in the hope that the day may come when the dominant secular viewpoints on morality will be extended from the church of Jesus Christ. Now, how he continued to do public ethics was, was to find resources in the law. I mean, Kahn in nine yeah, Edmund, Kahn. Edmund Kahn in Nine Modern uh, Moralist becomes a resource for him to explicate how a kind of ethic is possibly present in the law. And that's the reason why ethics at the edges of life is so important. Is. He's, he's discovering, oh, we still believe these things, the, in, in, the inviability of each person um, is bottom line. In medicine, he sees if Christians are not holding any longer to what he thinks are the fundamental principles of the faith, you can at least find it in medicine. <laughs> so uh, the, the medical imperative, uh, do no harm, and, um, uh, and you must never uh, um, care for a patient in a way that the care for the patient is subordinated to other concerns. It, are, are, I mean, see, that's the fun. That's what Jeff was talking about in terms of the Pauline rule. You never do harm that a good may accrue. So, so uh, Paul was finding what he thought were fundamental Christian presuppositions within the secular culture that he couldn't find in the church anymore, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, and that's. Um, uh, that put him in a very peculiar place, but it was a very fruitful place for him trying to think through that. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. These have been some tremendous reflections. I, I know I speak for everyone here when I uh, thank you for, for these. Um, I know we do want to leave some time for um, questions from the audience, but I know that different things might have piqued your interest um, while the others were speaking. So it might be suitable now to give each other just a few minutes to respond to the things have that have arisen. I question sure. for, I mean, you know, on the, did Paul have a theological, you know, kind of basis for that, you know, for his thought? I, I wonder if toward the end of his life he was finding that in the work of Jonathan Edwards. I mean, I think the work well, that's on sovereignty. That's the where so he but the sovereignty of God, but the, and then the sense of virtue, and, um, and 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 also a doctrine of creation that sort of, in, in terms of the you know the harmony, um, the whole notion yeah. of, the, of of Edwards' aesthetics, and I think it would be very interesting to look at the way Paul Ramsey reads Edwards, you know, um, versus the way another great Christian ethicist of the same time, James Gustafson, reads Edwards. Um, and and I think what you what you will see is you know the well it's the difference a Christology makes you know in a Christo a sense that um, that at the center of the the intelligibility of the universe as well as the the salvation of all human beings is Jesus of Nazareth who was the Christ. Ramsey believe, had a high, what we, I'd call a high Christology. He would say that that was at the center of things all the way along. Gustafson did not, at the end, have a high Christology. He thought Jesus was, he called him the incarnation of theocentric piety, So, uh, 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 but not didn't have a salvific role in the same way that Ramsey did. So you've got a sense of the sovereignty of God in both of them. It's out of the Calvinist tradition, but it's a way of thinking about it very differently. 
We're talking about the two most important Protestant ethicists of that generation. And I think Kathy has her finger on the most important thing they disagreed over. And it led to a fracturing of their relationship. Really. Yeah, they were close friends, and it they didn't end up that way. Gustafson spent most of his career in the mode of a kind of mild-mannered reporter analyzing trends in Protestant and Catholic ethics. Yeah, I call him the William Franken of Protestant yeah, ethics. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So he, uh, but then... He dropped a bomb. Then in two volumes, one in the early 80s and one <clears throat> right at the beginning of the 90s called Ethics from a Theocentric Perspective, he wrote a Jeremiah criticizing almost the entirety of Christian thought, arguing... No, they were both out before Paul died. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, that's true. It uh, had to be true. Right. That's correct. So, uh, so in the 80s. And uh, uh, what Gustafson did was to say, the sovereignty of God as a doctrine ought to have sovereignty over all the other doctrines. Right. See what I'm saying? Rock, paper, scissors. So that what that meant on the ground level for Christianity is that every doctrine that can be understood as an expression of the human desire for self-consolation should be under suspicion. <clears throat> and what is more expressive of the desire for self-consolation than the standard ways of understanding salvation and the standard ways of interpreting Jesus. The only thing I would add to that is it's not Gustafson alone, it's H. Richard. H. Richard's not very far from... No, as, as I... As I uh, H. Richard Niebuhr, one of his books was Radical Monotheism. I right. once described Gustafson's two exactly. volumes yeah. as radical monotheism radicalized again. Right. Right. And so what do you, you know, this is, this is just complete elevation of the sovereignty of God over all other Christian notions. And Ramsey, at a, at a conference uh, in honor of Gustafson, where his works were discussed, um, Stanley, you were there. You should tell the story. No, no, I wasn't there. I but I, I, you know, Paul Ramsey stood up in the audience and said, roughly, um, "Isn't this Professor Gustafson, uh, you know, a real break from the Christian tradition?" Yeah. And um, Gustafson hasn't yet for, forgiven him no, for did. that remark. No. So you can see these are these are issues that. Um, are of such central importance to people. You were talking about the most important things, and um, you know they they talking about the most important things honestly and even charitably can right. mm -hmm. generate can, breaks. Can, uh, uh, the other thing about uh, Jonathan Edwards, it wouldn't be. Um, I mean, it would be useful to compare Ramsey's Edwards with Gustafson, but it would be equally useful to compare Ramsey's Edwards with Niebuhr's. That's true. Because, I mean, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I've never focused Niebuhr, on Niebuhr's isolation of the nature of true virtue from the ends for which God created the world, right. Paul thought was a deep mistake. The charity sermons, too. Yeah, and, and having the charity sermons. So he was, um, he, he ne I don't think he ever explicitly criticized H. Richard. I mean, H. Richard Niebuhr was a saintly man who, um, I, ne I, don't, I don't give the impression that I knew him, I just knew people who knew him. Um, and um, uh, the piety was palpable, clearly. But, uh, and Ramsey held him in unbelievably high regard but I think he had fundamental disagreements Christologically. And 
when and speak up for just war and pacifism. I mean, that's the reason why Yoder haunted Paul. Yoder haunted Paul because Paul's Christology was closer to Yoder's than either of the Niebuhr's. And so, you ha I mean, Paul's signal comment and speak up for just war and pacifism is Jesus had no Jesus to imitate. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that, um, the, the central. I never say that Paul was a particularly pious. Oh, no, he wasn't pious. No, no, I said H. Richard. No, 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 no. Just, yeah. I was thinking about that. You know, it wasn't like he went around <clears throat> pietizing. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he ca I think that had a lot to do with being a preacher kid. Yeah. Uh, and, That's uh, and so, you know, uh, I mean, he was a preacher kid in Mississippi that didn't play football. I mean, you don't get lower than that, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, um, uh, the um, uh, and so I think he kind of brought that um, uh, effect with uh, to 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 um, to his work. I mean. Um, he he would never say shit in public, right? <laughs> I mean, it just wouldn't happen. Unlike uh, some people. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. I didn't use it. <laughs> you mentioned it. <laughs> right. All right. All right. All right. Is it okay with y'all if we move on to yeah. some audience questions? Um, you'll note two microphones here in the aisles. So if you do have a question, I ask that you move to the, the microphone in the aisles. And... Um, We'll take a few questions. I guess let's start off with, uh, with Anne. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so all this talk of just war and pacifism um, is really interesting and refreshing for me, even having been educated at sort of the heart of Niburian ethics at Yale, the conversation has really shifted from just war and pacifism to a theological conversation about justice. And we talk a lot about what might be the reason behind that. We are not a generation that is subject to a draft. We are a generation that there is relatively little overlap between the people who are fighting wars and the people who are being educated theologically. Um, but I was wondering if any of you think there are other broader theological conversations that account for that change. And um, perhaps more pointedly, particularly Professor Hauerwas, you might have some thoughts on this the implications for that shift for Christian theology and what some of the outcomes of the lack of conversation about war in theological discourse might have for us as Christians or participants in a largely Christian community. Thanks, Ann. I rarely do this, but <laughs> um, I've had a book come out called War and the American Difference, in which I try to shift the debates from just war and pacifism because What's been said has been, you don't need to say it. And I want to treat war as a liturgical event necessary for the development of the continuing sacrificial morality that is at the heart of the American project. It's where we send the youth to kill and to be killed to ensure ourselves that having sent the youth in the past to be killed and to be killed we are worthy of their sacrifice. And the larger sacrifice I think we ask of people is not the sacrifice of life itself, but the normal, the, the sacrifice of the normal unwillingness to kill. Mm. And then we ask them to come home and don't tell us. Mm. Um, so one of the, I'm, one of the most important things for those of us committed to Christian nonviolence is how to make that commitment strong without denigrating those that conscientiously participate. Mm. So one of the things I, I'm trying to do is to shift the, the arguments about war to a way to understand what an extraordinary moral project war represents. Now, I have a question that I've come up with that I think is a good question. If a war is not just, what is it? We continue to use, you go through the criteria and you think, well, four out of seven isn't bad, 
So we'll still call it war. What if you called it World Slaughter One, World Slaughter Two? Um, uh, I'm just, I mean, if a war is not just, what is it? I mean, because of the very fact that you continue to use war as a moral descriptor strikes me as a legitimating function. So those are some of the kinds of ways I'm, but see, I mean, crucial here. If you're committed to Christian nonviolence, you finally must acknowledge that you may have to watch the innocent suffer for your convictions. It's a harsh, dreadful position, but one I think is true. If, but I also think that's true for a serious just warrior. That is true. You're gonna have to watch the innocent suffer for your convictions at times. That's true of any serious moral position. And that's what we need to be talking about. Most of what we, that, that works about these matters, quite frankly, is superficial shit. And oh, you used it. Huh? Yeah, I used it. <laughs> and, and, and how to get the public, and what Ramsey was about was trying to increase the public discussions in a way that they really mattered. And I have nothing but the high regard for I, I just on the on that question, I, I wonder if the discussion that was paid to war or the attention that was paid to war was in a way sort of an anomaly, actually. Um, when did the the just war theory start starting getting it? We had two things. One was Vietnam, and the other was the possibility of nuclear annihilation. So it, it was a question of, a, of, of an impending ap 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 apocalypse. Don't forget, don't forget <laughs> Ford's essay about carpet bombing. That, right. I mean that that influenced that influenced Paul. Right, it did. But but the general discussion in terms, I mean, that essay and, and Elizabeth Anscombe's thing, and uh, you know, th those things kind of floated out their lonely little essays for you know a good eighteen years before they really got picked up. And so in terms of the discussion, so I, I think you had this sense that the world was going to be destroyed. Where I see that emphasis now isn't. We've got, you know, drones are targeted. Where where you get this sense of apocalyptic is not in the war well realm anymore in the current discussion, the current sensibility. It's in the climate change stuff. Yeah, but I mean, and, I mean, the military is such an important honor society. I mean, I was at the Air Force Academy a few years ago giving a lecture. Pacifist looks at just war, and I asked them if there's much discussion about war fighting strategies in which you can kill the enemy, but you yourself are never susceptible to being killed. And they regarded it as dishonorable. You can only kill if you're willing to be killed. Uh, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I think that, that I mean, where do you find that kind of discussion in American society? That's serious. I mean, Ramsey was serious about that kind of thing. I think Ramsey was right in affirming the need for absolute principles and in rejecting the standard pacifist account of what those principles require. Unfortunately, his alliance with um, social conservatives and his eagerness to play something like Niebuhr's role in American political life left the impression that he was essentially a conservative ideologue. Part of what Kathy was doing was trying to distance the real Ramsey from that perception of him. And I think she was right about that. But he, in effect, became the patron saint of the religious right. Okay? That had a number of effects. And one of those effects was that his extremely important points about the role of principles in human societies, the necessity to have principles that have um, edges to them, that actually are determinate enough to rule some things out, right? That it would be destructive to live in a society that did not, that did not affirm such principles because then 
what would, what would happen? And the, any leader can say then, consistently with Reinhold Niborian proportionalism, that I'm doing, I'm doing the lesser of the available evils, and that that then becomes the excuse to do almost anything. Murdering people, torturing them, so on and so forth. Well, this is, this is the irony of Niborian realism, isn't it? We've, it's now been four decades since, it's been many years since Niebuhr said what he said of, uh, about opposing the Nazis by any means necessary. And the dominant ethics of the ruling elite has been Niborian proportionalism. And one thing we learned when Obama, in a key interview early on, said, Reinhold Niebuhr's my man, when asked, you know, who's the most influential philosopher on your life? What we knew at that moment, if we had read Paul Ramsey, what we knew was that that meant that all of those principles he had enunciated during the campaign were going to turn to mush whenever push came to shove. And what that means is that a leader who enunciates principles of that type, rules of thumb, has not committed him or herself to anything. They cannot be trusted. They cannot be held accountable if that's the function of the principles. Right? That's an extremely important point. But where are the Christian ethicists, apart from Stanley's pacifist line, where are the mainline ethicists who are, shall we say, combining Ramsey's insight on the point with the part he didn't get from the liber liberationists, which is that domination is one of the things that must be ruled out absolutely. Okay. A Christian ethics is in a very bad way, and it's in a very bad way in part because the people who didn't agree with Ramsey on the social issues backed away from his very good point about the role of principles in human life and left themselves with an empty proportionalism that has no teeth, no way of holding leaders accountable for something. And so I think that's partly what you're picking up. You know, the loss of those discussions is the result of that way of backing away from Ramsey. There is, Jeff, <clears throat> there is the ambiguity in Paul, though. Reinhold's claim in moral man and moral society that once the faithful uh, concession has been made of politics over ethics, there cannot be any strong distinction between violence and nonviolence for the work of politics. Paul wanted to challenge that, mm -hmm. and, he, and he worked very hard in the just war to do that. It was resistance, not uh, violence. Yeah. But how, how he finally pulled that off in terms of how you maintain a just war ethic within a realist foreign policy, I think, was, I mean, he wanted. He, he, and I agree entirely that he didn't pull it off. Mm -hmm. And part of what I'm saying is that his own biases right. and his own desire to be the public That's figure right. who would testify before Congress and have the right. friendships with the major leaders and so on, which was you know, palpable when I first knew him. And I think he started to have serious doubts about it by the time he wrote that 1982 right. piece that you were mm -hmm. quoting. The person he's criticizing in that passage is the earlier Paul Ramsey. Yeah. Right, but that does that desire, uh, you know. Uh, so the, the 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 teeth of his earlier critique of nuclear deterrence, they get pulled. 
in the course of the 60s. The, the, um, if he had found a number of US military adventurers to condemn on just war grounds, the whole situation would have been different dialectically. I also think one of the things that happened though is that the religious right took the part of Ramsey, you know, the, the social issues, the no intentional killing of the innocent, particularly in the context of abortion, and held that up. And 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 what happened in the context of, of war and, 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 you know, the intentional killing or even the foreseen um, and unintended but still unjustifiable collateral damage, the loss in life, that that became less evident. And, 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 and in order to push ahead the agenda on the social issues, they were willing to make a deal with politicians who had a very unmitigated, uh, you know, realistic uh, vision of American foreign policy. I actually think there, this is just my own view, I've been thinking about this a lot. The main problem with this is is theological, actually. Um, if you hold that, and Paul would not agree with it, if you hold that the only innocent, really, is a child or an unborn baby, uh, you know, somebody who has not been, you know, exposed even to air, you know, and that everybody else is more or less corrupt and deserving of death, that, that, then you've really distorted, you know, one, your Christology, I mean, uh, and, and secondly, your sense of original sin. I mean, the whole point of the doctrine, if you're a mainstream Christianity of infant baptism, is to say we are all sinful, even the little and cute are sinful <laughs> in some sense, and, 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 and correspond Correspondingly, even the people who are not little and cute, but may be, um, you know, members of an enemy population, still bear the image and likeness of God. And this split that we have, um, which is theologically, I think, untenable, is causing a tremendous uh, uh, amount of harm, I think, to the actual inner workings of Christianity, where the dignity of a human being can't be meant to... to, to to, to be tied to their littleness, their cuteness, their, their, their looking like usness, um, and they're not uh, you know, being part of an enemy population. Let me read you a quote from Warren, the Christian um, Conscience, uh, uh, it's, uh, where he's talking about abortion. The fetus is not only a man with a right to life, but something of a Christian man who would not willingly exercise this right to the detriment of another at least not when the abstract right is of no advantage to him. Indeed, we should assume that if a fetus is capable of bearing rights, he is also capable of exercising them in a charitable manner. And, and at the least, this means that his own right to life should not be held onto in vain to the detriment of another. I, I mean, I, I mean that's, that, that's going against the Catholic position. That's not going to get him the Paul Ramsey Award. <laughs> so, but I, I don't um, think I don't think he ever backed away from that no, position. No, he didn't. Yeah. And his wonderful <clears throat> stuff in with challenging Germaine Grise, you know, really pressing through what it means to a principal isn't a talesman. A, you know, a, a, you have to think what it means to apply, to interpret, to, to extend its boundaries. And sometimes he got it wrong. Sometimes he changed his mind. I think the case of the curious exception yeah. is, is such an important essay, and he almost got to Anscombe <laughs> and didn't quite get it. So if it's not obvious, these folks um, know their Paul Ramsey and uh, other stuff besides. Um, it is about uh, 7.45, and I want to respect people's time. Um, I could sit here all night and listen to this, and I know that many of you probably could as well, but others probably have commitment, so we probably should wind it down. I bet that our um, presenters would be willing to stick around for a couple minutes if any really burning questions arise. Before wrapping up, though, and before thanking them one last time, I also want to thank the Department of Religious Studies, who has financed uh, most of this event, and thank the President and uh, the President's office for his support as well. And thanks again to all of you for coming, but let's give our presenters one more big round of applause, please.